Hello and welcome to Remainders, the podcast that brings you the movies. We talk about all the good ones, all the stuff that we missed, all the good stuff that we just want to watch again. Uh, joining me is my co-host, my Chicago counterpart, counterpart Patrick McIntyre. Pat, say hello to the fine people out there listening to our podcast. Oh, how's everybody doing today? It's good to see you, buddy. Good to see your face always. Always looking forward to the new pieces of art you got going on in your background. Well, I'll tell you right now, anybody who's watching this, you can't see the art, but I usually do have a lot of the art that I'm doing in my back in the background. However, this isn't my art this time. This is uh, our, my drummer's art that I'm holding for him. Uh, I had to pick up from an art show we did in San Bernardino. So behind me is Tom Higginson's art at Tom is an artist, and I'm showcasing that for him. He can thank me later. I'm sure he never even listens to it, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> um. Well, I know he's a Ramones fan, so if we, we do some more Ramones talk, um, we could probably do a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, I definitely recognize it. I've seen it on his um, uh, Instagram. He's he's definitely got a fucking cool style. I, I definitely dig it. Yeah, I mean, it's cool. It's like I told him the other day that, you know, he just started painting because he's a collector of art and he loves art, you know, just like all of us. Are. He's like, why not? I, well, I should just try. Try to see if I can paint. And um, I always looked at it through the lens of like, okay, like your yo-yo who's painting uh, all of a sudden because, you know, everybody else is. And then one day I kind of looked at it and I'm like, well, wait a second, if I can remove myself from being friends with him and like, look at this as like, let's say this was hanging up at like one of your favorite clubs or something. Right, 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 like, right. Yeah. Damn, this is fucking cool, you know? So like it, one day when I did that and I stepped away from it and I could picture this without him attached to it, I was like, he's a pretty good artist, you know? Hell yeah. Love it. Um, but today, other than art, well, which we talk about all the time, we are going to talk about a movie. This is a double feature, a uh, Brian De Palma double feature. And your favorite. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if anybody has checked out our last episode. It was on the movie Blowout, which this is another movie that starts with B. It's a body double. Um, I don't know if it's the movie that that followed up because I know like there was Scarface in there, right? So Blowout, I believe was a lot earlier than Body Double. Not a lot, but definitely no, by a yeah. few years because Just in a between couple of years, here, yeah. Yeah, in between here, uh, De Palma was doing some pretty big movies that he's remembered for. Um, I, I would venture to say that Blowout and Body Double aren't the top movies that come to mind for most people when they think of Brian De Palma, but we are covering both of those movies. So if you haven't heard our uh, episode on blowout you can go back and listen to that but today we're talking about body double which i do think that this is a good double feature i think these movies both are pretty good homages to alfred hitchcock i mean this one especially and i'm sure we'll get into that in a minute but body double is basically a softcore porno <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know it is actually i think the buzz thing that's going on right now is a lot of people are talking about erotic thrillers it seems to be like what everybody is like curating um i'm seeing a lot of places out here in los angeles curating um their programming for erotic thrillers and i know criterion released this film on an erotic thriller um programming as well and that's pretty great because uh it allowed us to to add it into our queue to talk about but yeah this is very very edgy as far as um it's more, it is borderline softcore porn at times um with the amount of nudity that's in it but it's also like we said very hitchcock in the way that it deals with voyeurism and it deals with a kind of everyman character that is a struggling actor in hollywood who gets cheated on by his girlfriend goes out and kind of falls into and be and is manipulated into um sort of a place to stay where he can overlook uh, a female that happens to get undressed every night and do a dance that he's entranced by, which leads to all sorts of bad things in his life. And we'll get into that in a minute. But I really feel that this film is excellent. However, there are a lot of things that we can pick apart. And I believe that has to do more so with the time that it was released. Um, I would think that this is more of a cult classic nowadays considered that than it is uh, a great movie. However, like 
we could talk about it, but I feel like there's certain things that could have happened in this film that could have made it a great movie. So Pat, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you and hear your initial first thoughts on Body Double. First, have you ever seen this film before? <laughs> okay, yeah. So this was the first time watching it, actually. Um, and uh, I text you. I, I was actually, when we were discussing it uh, on the last podcast, I have um, I was definitely confusing it with Body Heat. Right. Um, which is, I just looked up, it was like, it just uh, a year or two before uh, 1981 with William Holden, it just based off the name, I had seen uh, most of that like years ago. And when I, and, and so I was for a moment confused in the two movies, um, which I don't think is that crazy based on the title and kind of the premise, uh, just the looks of it in the early eighties vibe. Yeah. So, I've never seen that film, but I know it is included in the same um, yeah. like criterion like it's on Criterion too, so it certainly thrillers, wasn't yeah. uh, any throwaway movie at all. Um, oh, and remind me later, we got Criterion updates to go over. So once we get through this to the other stuff, okay. um, no, I was blown away by this movie. This is uh, fantastic. Um, you know, every time, and we were just discussing it last time with when we were going deeper into De Palma's filmography. It's like every time I see a new one of his movies, it's like yeah, I understand why among cinephiles he's viewed as one of the the great directors uh in modern cinema um it really was the the horror vibes uh that certainly got me uh hooked first in the movie i mean it starts off with that great um scene where sam wesser is playing a vampire um and is uh experiencing a little bit of claustrophobia uh, in the uh coffin and then it just kind of um keeps on going this definitely seems like the most hitchcock uh movie of his i i for for uh from what i've uh, seen of De Palma, this one seems like it's up there as like the most uh jerking off to hitchcock uh that he uh is, is gonna get to one thousand yeah and and that's again why it was like one of my favorites and i do think it is um among the movie fans and De Palma fans i think it is seen as uh certainly a top three for him um I, I i think i looked just vaguely i've been kind of always bruising like people rank in their De Palma, and it obviously varies like a lot like more than uh, most directors but uh, this one was consistently at the top uh or at least the uh, top half of most people's lists so there's definitely a sense of that but yeah it's certainly not uh that popular it's certainly a cult classic like this is not like one that is like all over the place uh it's not talked about too much on um you know like through youtube and uh covering uh people covering videos of it so that's kind of more of like a contemporary survey of like how how popular uh movies are in the zeitgeist but um this one seems kind of like in the middle with that and um and yeah i mean i was just kind of blown away by like the the stylized aspect of a mystery so mysteries are not normally my jam and it's largely because they're so plot uh driven which i more than most people i i think plot is about as disposable as as you can get in film um as in just not it's not the most essential part but it's the aesthetics everything around it that make a great movie and the characters and the uh, story within it so the plot within this are we do are we we're going spoilers I would yeah, say. I yeah i mean i believe yeah. so 84 so, you know well definitely um but well i largely because this movie is like so um plot driven like i said so like discussing everything like in the second half will definitely be giving everything away um everything that uh De Palma built around the plot i fucking loved his aesthetics are fantastic yeah, I, I so the plot basically is vertigo, right? I mean, we're talking about like a character who's obsessed with a woman that gets him in, you know, trouble and he kind of goes manic and, and crazy because of it. Um, and there's, you know, twists and turns. And I think the plot is nice for the voyeurism in general, for the audience and the care, you know, to kind of live vicariously through this character of um, play Jake Scully is his name, played by. Um, Craig Wasson. So like Craig Wasson as an actor, had you seen him in anything before this Craig film? Wasson. I said Sam Wasson. Yeah. So yeah, that's okay. But whoever, yeah. whoever that is, maybe Sam Wasson. Said. So I was watching half the movie uh, knowing I had seen him in something like there was something that I was like, I've seen this guy uh, up close 
uh, in something either recently or a long time ago. And finally, halfway through it, I just looked it up and he was um, in Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. He's a major part in that movie. So that's definitely what I know him very well from. I, I believe he's the psychiatrist, which is actually up there. The third one, Dream Warriors, is up there with the original. Certainly the most entertaining uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Well, OK, yeah, for sure. And I remember him from that. But in general, like this is a weird pick for a lead actor for a Brian De Palma film, especially after yeah, he, was, he was kind of a I mean, he certainly wasn't a famous uh, face or at all. So, well, like, think about it. Like if we're talking about that, he's already done Scarface and he's all, already done Blowout, you know, working with John Travolta and stuff like that. I mean, that's why I think this is a great double feature, because we're kind of dealing with a character in the main lead that is like all of us. Um, a little bit more, you know normal everyday joe who kind of works a normal job that isn't some sort of you know person who you can really not relate to like some kind of rich guy or something like that this is somebody who's like in our level you know and so you can see yourself possibly getting caught up in all of these insane um sort of twists and turns that these characters do. And I think maybe more so than Travolta, you relate a little bit more to Jake Scully. I mean, he's an actor in Hollywood trying to make it. And the first scene he walks in on his girlfriend who's cheated on him. And there's that really crazy like stare down that they do where she kind of like doesn't even care that she got caught, you know? Like yeah. you can see that like, he just is kind of a loser, you know? And that's the bummer I think for the character and why he gets into such such like a predicament is because he is vulnerable. He's got this also thing, just like in Vertigo, Jimmy Stewart has this traumatic experience that happens to him and he causes him to have Vertigo, which, you know, um, means he can't go certain places and like find out like the real full story um, of what's happening to him. And so that kind of happens with this lead, the character as well, is that because he's kind of has this phobia or something of like tunnels and enclosed spaces, it really gets in the way of him moving forward in different things. We see it in the scene where he tries to get the purse from the guy who snatches it and different things like that. And especially in that first scene where he is the vampire and he kind of loses his job because of that. So he's got a lot of flaws, just like all of us do. He's been cheated on by his girlfriend, which most of us usually <laughs> in this life at some point or another, you know, have been cheated on by a significant other. So we kind of all relate to it already. And that's the thing about this character. I don't think he's a great actor uh, or a great choice for a lead, but then I backed up a little bit. I was like, well, maybe he's perfect because we were kind of like, don't really love him because he kind of reminds of us our, of ourselves a little bit. Um, yeah, a lot there. Um, or I'll start um, plot wise. I mean, you'll definitely be able to tell me a little bit more. I mean, I saw a lot of rear window um, in this, right? For and sure. I, okay. Because you said the plot was mostly exactly like Vertigo, um, which I'm sure is right. It's been a minute since I've watched Vertigo. So like beat for beat, I don't quite remember all of it, but like, I was definitely responding mostly to the rear window. Yeah, and I mean, the, the rear window the thing has to do more with the voyeur and looking out of the binoculars yeah. and stuff like that and like kind of peering into your neighbors, like the places you shouldn't be looking and seeing yeah. private things that you shouldn't be seeing. But like the chase scene and the voyeurism of like going in the Beverly Center where they're like kind of going through the okay. mall yeah. and the chase in the car in the in the car and you know, all of that stuff is very, very vertigo. The the scene with the kiss that happens where the camera spins around again, we got that like great blowout uh <laughs> scene that you loved, you know, which Volta. It's he so does it good. again here, yeah. but it's a complete ripoff of Alfred Hitchcock and Vertigo, where that okay. scene happens and he's picturing it's the other woman, you know, in the transformation. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of maybe both. Maybe it's a, like a perfect mix of both Rear Window and Vertigo. Yeah, I just I guess I just respond a little bit more, or I'm just more familiar with his uh, voyeurism uh, obsession. Um, and like we were talking about, because um, obviously Blowout is a huge part of that, and I mentioned Peeping Tom. Um, I sent you that info that's uh, on Criterion, which might be a good one to check out. Um, oh, right. Uh, so uh, the other thing you were talking about, I think um, Watson, Craig Watson is is fucking great in this movie. I, I, I do think he's um, 
I almost want to give him the benefit of the doubt. A lot of his acting is a little cheesy and hammy, uh, but I, whether or not that's intentional, I think it fucking works. Yeah, like so that's perfect. what I can't really understand. And 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 as Which, like a viewer, like should I, I don't, like that yeah, or not? I don't know. I don't really care whether it's intentional okay. or not because it's just fucking. It makes what I watched uh, today uh, great. Uh, it just worked for the movie, and it definitely works for his character because it's like the character is an actor who is, you know, may or may not be a great actor in in the movie itself, like the character he's playing. And he ends up doing uh, uh, porno. Uh, so it just it just kind of, it works for me, like watching his character, uh, Jake, uh, be like an okay actor. Like he, like the entire time he's like tailing uh, Gloria, uh, which is the woman he's been watching. Yeah, Gloria Ravel, I think is her name, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. the entire time he's like this guy is not that great at making it seem like he's not tailing her like he was like so <laughs> obviously such a fucking creep just like creeping on her i'm like uh you could probably be a little bit more smooth uh and make it a little bit less obvious and and so it's just his you know questionable acting talent is um certainly wasn't um a problem for me uh i did because it just worked so well uh in it so yeah, I feel like um, that's the other thing I'm not sure about because it's like 1984, right? So like in my kind of like, I don't know, the time period makes it feel a little bit like there's not like a lot of, um, there's not a lot to say about like the time period other than like, you know, the lack of maybe technology to do certain things or whatever. Like The movie relies a lot on like the Palma using the camera, just like it does in, in, in uh, Blowout. Um, in the way that the director is like very, very secure and, and, and understands how to move that camera, you know, around. And it's also like playing with the audience a lot. Um, I really feel like LA was an interesting place. So I sent you on Instagram that tale of uh, tale of the pup and you're probably okay. Like, yeah. So I, I had not watched, I watched the movie today. So I didn't know what I, I was like, Oh, is he, okay. Is he, is he doing like, what was he sending me tale of the pup for? Is he doing uh, uh, their um, artwork for him on the new menu or something? I know. I figured so, you had no <laughs> idea when I said that. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's fine. So, I was like, I, I'm definitely familiar with that place with the freaky looking hot dog uh, that it's built into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I just loved it because like, um, as I was rewatching it, um, I have recently relocated to Los Angeles two years ago. So I haven't watched the film since I've re- uh, relocated. And I didn't realize how many places are like just right around the corner. Taylor oh, yeah. is just recently like renovated and, and back. And then um, the farmer's market makes an appearance in there, which is um, pretty classic. And then, you know, that that home that he's in, and I remember telling my girlfriend about that, that's out here, I've never been to it, but it's obviously like such a crazy location, right? It looks like a spaceship and all that. Um, there's a there's a lot of information about that on the Wikipedia that you can look up, but that's here in California as well. So I kind of did a quick look. So what I know it from is Troy McClure's house in The Simpsons. That's true. That's right. <laughs> that's I, like, totally I don't know. About that. I don't know anything like actual of what it's based on, but that's what I recognize her from is that that's the house that he's living in. Um, yeah. In the episode when he's trying to make a comeback with uh, Jeff Goldblum as his um, uh, agent. That's so it was right. like told, the second I, totally I saw it, I was forgot. like that 100 percent that's where they got this from or at least uh, inspired by it so I love and that's what that. i'm trying to say about this film like a, about being in the 80s because like it, it it's very much like you know a time and place uh, in history and so i'm not sure like i don't know like i i don't know why it is this like this with me but like there's certain time periods of like movies that are made that kind of feel like maybe a little bit more cheap or something to me like i've talked talked about the 70s films kind of weird me out (laughs) i don't there's something about the filmmaking process in these like decades that just don't feel as put together sometimes and that's why i'm saying i think De palma does a great job of like moving the camera around and directing this film to make it seem like that cheapness kind of like lends itself to the story maybe that's what i was trying to say well i mean yeah 84 is still the beginning of the idea of a blockbuster. Um, and then just generally movies were still thriving in the um, lower budget, um, almost independent um, kind of vibe. They weren't quite 
uh, indies like they became in the 90s but throughout the 70s like studios were more willing to like uh, throw you know a little bit of money at a movie and then give the director full control which is mm -hmm. what made the 70s so unique and so innovative and so important of a decade and and so going into the 80s I mean technology wise I mean I was thinking about 84 is a fucking great movie you got the Terminator and you got um, Razorback in the same year uh, wow. so yeah so look, now, look at the technology difference now, in those two films you know body double exactly so you see like the I mean, actually, when you look back, like, uh, the Terminator uh, had some pretty innovative effects, but they were still janky. I mean, that was like a look. It was still technically, I mean, for as many special effects as they had, it was kind of a lower budget film. Like he was doing a lot of guerrilla filmmaking stuff, like filming without permits and whatnot. So that's what kind of just makes that movie so unique. James Cameron coming off of uh, Rock and Roll High School uh, <laughs> to make The Terminator. I mean, I, I didn't mean, even know that. I figured you'd appreciate it. Yeah, I know. I learned that a couple of years ago. I was like, well, and maybe he was the one who get, who brought in the pizzas for Dee Dee uh, for that scene. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, obviously an early uh, uh, job for James Cameron just to yeah. help out. With, but I mean, uh, not too far removed from making Terminator. So that's got to be like the end of the 70s, maybe of Rock and Roll High School. And then he did uh, Terminator 84, huh? So yeah, not that far removed from his job on working with the Ramones. In Roger you Cameron. know what? Yeah. And actually, I'm seeing the connection now and now I'm thinking about it because he made so Piranha 2, I love these tensions, by the way. I'm pro-tangent uh, when we go on uh, certain directors, just FYI. Um, his first movie was Piranha 2, um, which was a sequel to Joe Dante's movie Piranha. And Joe Dante was either the co-director or co-writer of Rock and Roll High School. So right. there's obviously a James Cameron, Joe Dante uh, early connection to get him started when he st uh, first started doing it, though. So yeah wow interesting yeah I, I i love the tangent by the way too i mean it's these all these movies and like especially like after just reading and finishing cinema speculation you see how all of these things kind of meld together and to follow what you were saying about the director having kind of like full control in the 70s this is maybe uh this movie that we're talking about today is maybe on the edge of like where that kind of stopped being so much of the case because it seems like body double i read that but De Palma. He, he he forced the issue of a lot that he wanted to do in this film so much to where they cut ties amicably from what i understand with columbia uh, a three-picture deal that they were supposed to be um going into because of this movie bombed so bad and because they both didn't enjoy themselves i guess he had like some comments that i read about it being owned by pepsi i think or something like or coca-cola or something like that and he's like yeah do you think like these people like really want like this softcore porn you know being made <laughs> yeah. with their umbrella you know right 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 uh love it um Okay, I mean, speaking of the sex, I mean, the yeah, first scene, first sex scene we see is his girlfriend, uh, who uh, is played by the great Barbara Crampton. And in that, like, once it's all she's in, she's usually, he just walks in on her, uh, she's having sex with somebody, and they, they kind of share that weird look that she kind of gives them. And you can see, I mean, she is a great actor. Um, you know, she went on to do Reanimator, uh, From Beyond both Stuart Gordon movies, adaptations of um, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, two of the best horror movies of the 80s by far. So, And you could definitely see um, how she was a major part of that because uh, she was such a great actress and fit right into horror so well. Yeah, it seems like there was like a lot of like little like small parts for some big players that kind of came up um, later. It seemed like uh, from when I was reading about the movie that De Palma didn't get like all of his wish list, um, you know, fulfilled for this film. But we got to talk about like Melanie Griffith has a, has a big role in this. And she I believe she credits this film to being a big reason why she's gone on to have like such a great career, um, apart from the fact that she's Tippi Hedren's daughter. I was going to say, I mean, there's a Nepo, not just a Nepo baby, there's a Nepo family uh, lineage. Yeah, I mean, I always forget that she's Tippi Hedren's daughter. Uh, but I mean, I definitely know that she's Dakota Johnson's mother. Yeah. Um, so that that lineage of nepotism just kind of, you know, all great. I actresses. mean, this is a fucked up but, role yeah. as like a Hollywood royalty elite's daughter to be playing. I mean, she's basically uh, porn, a porn porn pornography actress in this film yeah. she's naked half the time you know what for I mean? sure yeah 
uh, yeah, I mean, it's still <laughs> a good opportunity for a lot of actresses who would want to work with a big director for sure. So yeah, I mean, but it's 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 like it's more naked than most people have been in films. I mean, you know, like sometimes you see topless scenes and stuff like this, but like you're kind of almost seeing all of Melanie Griffith in this film. And again, that's the kind of film it is. And um, she, you know, had no problem doing any of it. But I, it is like again, I, I'm joking when I say it's softcore porn, but it is it deals with pornography, which is like part of it. And it also shows a lot of that. Um, it's, it, it's really pushing the envelope of like what, I guess like this didn't get an X rating, but like pop probably should have back then, you know, it got, I believe it got an R rating. I saw a quick interview uh, from 84 with De Palma, um, a pretty chill interview. And, and the um, journalist was asking like whether this was going to get an X rating. And he was just kind of, Kind of laughing it off, but yeah, still like he looked straight at the camera. It was like, yes, this is an R movie. Basically, he was he was basically assuring the audience that yeah, you can you can go see this movie. This is not a porno, even though it has porn qualities to it. So <laughs> totally. I mean, especially that you tell he was worried about uh, people being scared off by the X rating. So the entire end credits, and this is a spoiler for anybody, but maybe this is why people <laughs> might watch the film. The entire end of the of the movie is the credits are rolling over a vampire putting his hands all over a, a woman's breasts. I mean, that's, that's the, the credits roll over that. So, you know, I think this is like one of those films as a kid that I probably would have seen on Cinemax, like scrambled out and been like, Oh, oh what, what is this? You know, like excited, like, oh, oh, there might be some naked woman on TV. Like this could have been the film. <laughs> Vampires, blood, and tits. I mean, what more do you want? Yeah. It sounds like, <laughs> like the perfect combo, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, I mean, the lead character is down on his luck by a lot of, you know, bad things that happen pretty quickly in this film. And his entrance into like this world happens, of course, very much like a Hitchcock movies does because he's, you know, meets somebody just like strangers on the train or whatever, who's like, okay, I'm going to manipulate you into doing what I want done because they see the vulnerability in somebody who needs something right and he yeah. needs a place to stay he's sleeping on people's couches um and we don't really understand quite yet what's happening but i forget the name of the character who was just like that that really shitty guy who um brings them to the to the place uh um, the main guy sam yeah yeah what's his name sam it, the character is sam yeah yeah he um really takes advantage of him, acts like he's his best friend. And here we are, we're like, okay, you know, Jake's got a great thing going. He's got this cool pad. He's finally, his luck is turning around and he watches across the way, this girl getting undressed and sees that she's a rich woman who, you know, has a lot of jewels and stuff. And at one point sees an Indian guy working on like, what seems like, I don't know, what is that? Like a satellite or something and he's watching satellite the Indian tissue. guy watching the woman and it looks like this is where I mean, and what a great face on this guy right like he's really scary looking he's got these weird teeth and stuff like that and this is where it really becomes like kind of like a horror movie you know it's like you see this character who's like frightening and ends up breaking in at one point right so I you I don't know if you want to continue on here uh i mean yeah like we said this is heavy spoilers so i mean were you actually i mean like i said i saw this for the first time today so were you uh ever like actually surprised by sam being the guy uh yeah yeah you were kind of was yeah i okay. mean did you know the whole time i thought it was way obvious and I, again i'm not ever able to predict the ending of plots or anything yeah neither am i usually and i yeah. I, I don't look at you and it's like it's largely i'm not i'm i'm usually bad at it even if i'm trying which i'm not like i just don't watch movies that's why like thrillers don't always do it for me like david fincher is one of the best directors out there but like a lot of his you know it's not because of like the plot and the who done it it just isn't uh and i don't really i've read mystery novels before uh and they're fine I think something like Ryan Johnson, again, like doing the Knives Out, great director. I'm never going to watch the Knives Out movies again because this is like 
Yeah, I'm yeah. not like a huge fan of those yeah. either. And I do love Ryan Johnson. Like I love Brick. Yeah. And that's yeah. another mystery, you know. It, again, me. it's just like you have like amazing directors making a mystery. It's definitely worth watching it. But like figuring out a plot is just doesn't, it's just not how my brain works. I'm never I'm surprised like, you knew though. I mean, he's he's definitely so I'm not giving alert. myself any credit. Um I think it's entirely because we've just been talking about De Palma a lot. Uh, I've seen a lot of De Palma. I've seen a lot of Hitchcock. I know his style. I, and I think, again, because it being in the early 80s, it being so influential to so many movies that I've loved since. I mean, I thought of like Under the Silver Lake a lot while watching this movie. It's just like this was like innovative in a way to a lot of movies that I've seen before. So the second that the husband showed up where you see him uh, beaten Gloria and then the Indian character, which um, is pretty wild. It was pretty obvious to me that that was Sam, the guy who gave him the apartment at the very beginning. Yeah, it's a pretty elaborate hoax, right? <laughs> you know, so yeah. for everybody watching out there, the reason I said there's spoiler alerts is because the Indian who I talked about earlier, who's watching her, the first like thing that we see, like, yeah, there's some sort of husband of the woman that uh, Jake is watching from around the way. And we, he notices the first day that he's like kind of throwing her around and beating her and stuff like that. This is actually the guy, Sam, who introduced Jake to this home to watch in the first place. And then we see the second day as Jake's watching the, the girl do her dance. He sees this Indian putting together like some sort of, I don't know, maintenance on a satellite and who's peering in to watch the show that second night. But that ha all of these people are the same people. So the husband, the Indian, and the guy that is Sam, who's the friend Scully has that put him into his place. It's like really a lot going on here, but it's the same character. But we don't know that yet as the audience. We just think there's this like interesting thing unfolding, except for Pat, who figured it out right away, I guess. Um, Again, it's like, uh, but no, yeah. no no credit to myself. I, I, it's just, I know his obsession with doubles. And the it was mostly the framing, just like the covering. And it was partly so like uh, the the actor we're talking about is Greg Henry. Um, yeah. You can kind of I mean, it's pretty obvious uh, in terms of his body frame that um, and build that like you, he's you're, he's introduced to Sam. And then each time they cut to either the the husband or uh, the other character, it's like it's, and you can kind of see it in his eyes. I mean, the second I was like suspecting, it, it was like, yeah, that's obviously the same actor doing it. So the, the th I, th I guess the thing that like you might not um, did you know that Melanie Griffith was like the body double for the wife doing the dance or anything like that? I mean, I think it was. I mean, a lot of those shots were clearly not Melanie Griffith because they, yeah. you, you could see. Right. Right. But then okay. you, like later on, you find out that it was her um in like playing that role to trick him the 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 the, the reason Which i was that, still kind of confused yeah it, because the reason yeah. this unfolds is he sees that porno that he's watching right. and melanie griffiths is doing the dance in that yeah. i've seen that before yeah so like that plot line is 100 percent vertigo as well because like okay. the body <laughs> double of replacing the wife with somebody else um pretending to be the wife so that you you know can dispose of the real wife and kill her or whatever like that like that's the whole point Man, but yeah it's a little confusing yeah, there's priorities. a lot going on here yeah <laughs> no um, i mean it, it i mean i don't think this plot, the plot was or the story wasn't confusing at all really it was just more of um his directing style i guess is just uh what i i mean what i loved about it too but then also like partly why it was, it was obviously greg henry the actor but then um I guess yeah the only thing like so when he was originally watching Gloria that was Gloria or yeah so they're saying basically that it wasn't they're, okay, saying... So they're saying it wasn't but the with the way De Palma shot those original scenes it, yeah it wasn't Melanie Griffith it was the other actress that's what I think okay but gotcha. they're saying basically at the end like no that was Melanie Griffith because she she admits it she or she's like yeah I was paid to go over there and do this dance or whatever. So uh, then, I'm definitely cool with that. Like, cause you can tell it's not 
a Melanie Griffith dancing at the beginning because you could see the woman's face. You, and I know what Melanie Griffith looked like. I, was, I could tell uh, that wasn't her. Um, yeah. But then just for them to be like, well, this is, you know, what is real, you know, you know, it, just because something's on, 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 you have a shot of it doesn't mean it's uh, real or it's not somebody else's perception of it. So it yeah. And then there's that scene that, that he's like basically obsessed with the woman, whoever that is that he's peering into. He kind of doesn't even right. really care who it is because of that kiss scene that happens. It's like, oh, well now I'm with Melanie Griffith, but I'm thinking that it's that woman that I was seeing in there. So yeah, they're, you're just playing with like, the reality that all of us are experiencing the characters and the person um that's living this this life the actor the struggling actor jake scully who's our main character yeah um yeah greg hangry speaking of him sam i mean i knew i knew him from I mean, he's been in a lot he's been in a couple of the born movies um i knew him from uh the james gunn horror movie slither i don't know if mm. you ever saw that He's, mm -hmm. he, he plays the uh, mayor in the small town. He's pretty, he's second or third lead in that movie. And he's fucking hilarious in that movie. <laughs> he's so good. And I could like see, like he's got glimpses of that smarmy asshole type uh, early in this movie. And I was like, yeah, I could see why James Gunn wanted him for that role. So yeah, James Gunn went on to have a pretty good career after that. huh? Uh, yeah, he showed up in Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm just looking at his name. He played McCready in Slither, by the way. Oh really? Okay. Clear, yeah. clear. Uh, John Carpenter reference for the thing on that one. Yeah, uh, which is not the only reference actually in Slither. Uh, oh, what a great movie. Um, Two thousand six is Slither, I think. Right? Yeah. 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 Really good. Um, yeah. I, again, he was great. It was also partly, like I said, it's like I knew this actor was like a second or third lead, and. And by the time he disappeared, I'm like, well, he's obviously one of these actors if he's like a second or third lead because you, you haven't seen Sam uh, for like an hour. So he's obviously somebody who's on screen the whole time. So totally. And I, I just love that scene. I mean, there's a lot of like cool little talk about like um, nice, like little voyeuristic moments. And there's that really nice, again, very much an homage to Hitchcock where he's following the actor. Uh, I'm sorry, not the actor. Um, the character Jay, Jake Scully is following the woman who he sees dancing in the window across the way. Um, and what's her name again? It's Rachel, right? Sorry, I'm getting mixed up on this. Gloria is the original girl. Oh, Gloria. So it's actually Gloria. And he's following her. And they get into the Beverly Center here in LA. And then they have this whole like kind of zigzag cat and mouse game that he's having. And <laughs> who so shows good. up? Yeah the the indian guy and he's like oh my god she's in so much danger but he's like sitting there as a peeping tom like watching right. her put her underwear on and then on the other end of the glass is uh the indian and that's such a great well done sequence i mean that's very that's the palma at, a, at like peak to palma for sure right there oh i mean some of the just the tracking shots uh is, i mean it's it's also just like a pacing that just doesn't really happen in movies anymore yeah. Um, somebody was mentioning like um, at the time I'm thinking of like Alien the original Alien like that movie was seen as like um, like overly fast paced and just too much in your face at the time and it's like now it's like there's no way a movie would be ever that slow of a pace now uh, just on like a big scale like that at all that, it yeah. seemed like a, a, a like a uh, drudgery to a lot of uh, mainstream audiences now it just shows like how like uh, they got to the directors got to take their time a little bit more back in the day yeah I mean that's another thing about it it's like it's taking you on a ride and you kind of have to like sign up for that you know that Beverly Center stuff is great too because there's a lot of high shots um, so you can kind of see like again the kind of cat and mouse the kind of mouse trap idea that's happening here where you know, getting on escalators, getting in elevators, following dead ends, you know, that kind of stuff. It's really cool. Um, and then we got that great scene that comes up when he leaves the Beverly Center and he follows Gloria to um, this place that's in Long Beach and it's um, basically overlooking the ocean. And then, you know, when you see those like great, like kind of Jaws-esque, like little like huts on the beach, you know, those are going to play like somehow in like a maze as well. And um, that's when 
you know, the Indian finally reveals himself to, and snatches that purse. Um, that's such a great scene. And especially it's, it, it's, it's actually very much terrifying. I don't know if you felt this way when they do get into that tunnel and Jake, our lead actor here kind of has that, I can't go any further because he has that vertigo thing that happens to him. And this trauma impacts him where he can't really move. He's in this closed space, uh, claustrophobia, I guess is what you'd call it. And the Indian realizes like this guy is in trouble and he, he can't do anything. And he takes advantage and takes his time to go through the, and we get to watch the Indian go through the wallet and take what he wants with the lead character vice via through the lead character. We're also paralyzed, like we can't move, but, and we, yet we have to watch this horror unfold of the Indians taking and like what else is he going to do is he going to come and kill him you know like you just don't know what's going to happen and he does that quick woo, and he like <laughs> runs away and it's like oh my god this is like fucking scary you know i don't know if you felt that way guys having fun with it for sure um yeah, yeah that's why i think wasson is is good in this movie because there's uh scenes where he's having like uh, uh panic attacks basically because of the claustrophobia i mean those are pretty legit um on screen at least so but you know what's kind of like the thing that this is where I'm saying it's like a little things I could have done better a little bit, you know, he comes out of the gets help. Gloria finally comes over, sees that he got the, you know, purse back, but like that he's in trouble that he's, he, you know, and he asks for help. Can you get me, help me get out of here. Gloria and him are like, finally like talking, you know, she did, she noticed that he's following him or her. But when they get out of there, all of a sudden they share this kiss. Again, very vertigo and everything's spinning. And it's kind of like, I just don't really believe it. Like, you know, like they don't know each other at all. There really doesn't seem to be very much chemistry between the two of them. Um, I guess maybe it's just like the excitement of the fact that like there's this like person following me. And, you know, obviously he's obsessed with her. I mean, there's, I mean... I mean, I get what you're saying. I mean, but it, it definitely works. I mean, nothing in this movie is believable. So it's like the fact that they just pull out of the the uh, uh, the tunnel and just start making out. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think and kind of like weirdly perfect making for it. You yeah. know, like he, that's yeah. why I'm saying, like, I don't know, Jake Scully is kind of like a weird guy. Like it's he doesn't. Like, they, he's like, oh, you've been following me, haven't you? No. And then they just start making out. It's like, what, <laughs> yeah. I mean. They, and there's nothing about that dialogue that makes sense. So they're, they're, I wouldn't expect anything about like uh, the progression to them having sex or anything. Making well, sense. So, and talking yeah. to you makes more sense to me <laughs> about that scene, because again, it like it, that scene has to happen for the movie to have like any kind of like, you have to have the understanding that that happened for the rest yeah. of the movie to kind of culminate. But like, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like you don't have to really believe it, it but it has to happen. Yeah. I mean, it really is just, I mean, again, it's just how you're watching certain movies. It's like, it's what you see on screen, you know, doesn't have to represent reality. If you're on board for like most of what you're seeing is not reality, then, uh, you know, that doesn't mean you can just get away with anything, but like um, you can, you can have a, a character arc where voyeurism leads to porn and it works perfectly <laughs> <laughs> well that's the difference okay so you have this film where you, you get this and again you don't really have to believe it or you know you know you're getting into a movie like this for a you know a certain style and you don't have to yeah fully be engaged or you could get into like you know shutter island where like you kind of have a lot of things that are happening in this movie happening in shutter island yet the the connection between the lead character and the wife that he's lost um, that brought him to the brink of where his he's he's now in this insane asylum. Do you believe those scenes when it's Michelle Williams and Leonardo DiCaprio and you are really connected to their story and you're really, really invested in the two of them and how they got to where they are? But that's not happening in this film. Like you, these two people could could like make out like they do or they could not like you don't really it doesn't really you don't feel anything yeah i need to watch rewatch um shutter island by the way i haven't seen it since the theaters it's fucking sure. awesome yeah I mean, I mean i love it i've seen like kind of a few small clips ever since i mean i remember loving it for sure and it being more, one of the more plot heavy 
movies for Scorsese. I mean, it's a lot like this because, like, it's kind of like there's a lot of twists and turns, and there's a lot right. of like we don't yeah. the, the audience doesn't really know what's going on the whole time. So, um, but and there's no reason why, like, based on the ending, like that, that should I should have like just rewatched it immediately, uh, but I didn't, uh, and I haven't gotten around to it since. So, yeah, uh, maybe I mean, that's I'm a sure... little bit of an overlooked Scorsese, I would say. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, he's like he's like Bob Dylan because his everything he does is pretty great. So, like, even like the stuff that doesn't like rise to the complete top gets overlooked even though that's still better than what most other people are putting out so 2010 so that movie's like 13 years old now i think it's 2010 was it really oh yeah. my god holy shit mark ruffalo is awesome in that as well um yeah we got october for killers of the flower moon i think i originally said april which may have been the can the cons uh can's uh premiere but I don't think we'll be able to see it unless we go to cons until October. So I didn't know that that was a, a final, uh, like that had been announced that they were going to um, do that in October. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, that's I, I'm pretty sure that's the official release date. And well, man, I, I sent so, you. We hoping I live to October to see it. I sent you. Oh, okay. So we'll we'll, we'll keep it with the follow, but uh, a couple of actors um, that is possible that uh, Brendan Fraser. Uh, his character is getting cut but then also I learned from the same article that John Lithgow uh, filmed some scenes in Killers of Flower Moon and then apparently maybe his scenes got cut although it's it, the runtime is pushing four hours so I don't know who's getting Shut cut that's I mean that's the last number that I saw I, so I don't know who's getting what's cut going from, on with this film I, I know, mean right, right, right. you I don't know, know who's it's getting been cut done from for a while it seems movie. like but it yeah killers no I mean, it's been shot. It's been. I, I think that it's been in the can. I think it's like more in the edit now, isn't it? Uh, I'm now, but it's it's not like it's been like it's not like it was shot like three years ago. Because then I also heard that they had to go back and like shoot some like pretty key scenes that when they thought they were finished. Uh, I don't know. It's maybe. weird. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's certainly. I mean, it's a huge Scorsese movie, so it's obviously a long shoot. But um, but I don't know. Uh, I really hope both Razor and um, John Lithgow uh, end up in the movie. And staying on Lithgow for a second, uh, we had an awesome discussion talking about him last week. But yeah, shout out to our friend of the show, Don. Uh, he pointed out, um, he was putting a spotlight on Lithgow's performance in The Twilight Zone. Um, I think he commented on YouTube on that. Have you seen Twilight Zone, the movie? I saw his comment. I haven't seen that. Like the, the gremlin thing? Okay, so Twilight Zone, the movie... I grew up, it was on HBO all the time. So I remember seeing it a lot when I was like a young kid. I probably saw that even before some of the old episodes. Um, it's a four part movie, four different directors. Spielberg does one of the, the um, scenes. Uh, Joe Dante, who we were just talking about, did Gremlins. He did one of the scenes. Um, John Landis, which I think he did the scene where uh, the actor was actually killed. Uh, in a helicopter crash it oh, was like shit. a pretty it was a pretty notorious thing it was like they were filming on site and there was a helicopter crash uh the actor who's actually the, the asshole coach from bad news bears um wow. that actor was killed along with a couple other people uh landis did that one but then so the fourth one is the john lithgow one it's the one twenty thousand feet a uh, nightmare at 20,000 feet. It was like the, the uh, original uh, one with uh, William Shatner on the plane when he sees the gremlin out in the window. Yeah. So it's a remake of that. Direct. So this scene is directed by George Miller of uh, Mad Max fame, did all four of the Mad Max movies. And I found out that George Miller did this one like around the time Fury Road came out, which is still one of my favorite movies of that decade. And it just blew my mind because you can see George Miller's style, which is just like fucking intense and like in your face, like most of the time throughout the entire skit. And John Lithgow is so good at just like he keeps on seeing this gremlin out on the side of the plane, keeps on trying to tell everybody on the plane. Nobody believes him. And he's just getting increasingly like he's going insane, basically, because he's like he already has a fear of flying. And then now you've seen this uh, this monster out on the plane um, trying to destroy the plane. Fucking great. I would highly recommend checking out at the very least the whole, uh, that scene, if not the whole movie. But um, yeah, just adding 
uh, that's definitely an awesome performance by John Lithgow. It's all, everything you're talking about, even like the helicopter crash, all of these like stories are very familiar to me. And mm. I don't know why, like I, maybe I yeah. saw it one point in my life, but like, cause like even like the whole, like John Lithgow and a gremlin, like it sounds familiar. I just don't know yeah. like, where I would have seen it. I mean, it was on TV a lot uh, when we were growing up. I mean, I think it was 83, I want to say. I mean, those directors um, are all pretty big, hitty, big heavy hitters, you know? It's all. I mean, George yeah. Miller was obviously the, the uh, certainly um, among directors as famous, just not as famous of a name. It was definitely seen as like kind of a debacle with the helicopter crash, but uh, it definitely is a bananas movie as a Twilight movie should be so yeah okay sorry you just pause for a second um yeah this this is definitely something i gotta check out and so uh, yeah yeah dude kudos to don for knowing that and writing that because dude okay. lithgow he's like lithgow is like uh i think underappreciated i mean i think we can honestly say that and and that be true like i know he's like people know who he is and he's third rock from the sun and shit like that but like some of the movies we're talking about like even blowout last week last time um he's insanely good in that yeah you know? Yeah, I mean, I would not be against um, keeping with the Palma, maybe for a few more movies, and maybe even doing Raising Cain. Um, yeah, that would be a fun, more of a fun um, Lithgow movie to watch. Uh, even though it was directed by the Palma, it's got a lot of tinges of it, but like, it's a pretty unhinged performance. And um, it's been a few years since I've seen it, but like, it's definitely a fun one to watch. So, yeah, I I, uh, I think we were talking last time. Like, yes, he, he had he's written a few books too. I bet you those are pretty entertaining. <laughs> uh yeah a couple kids books i read his memoir which was pretty decent so wow yeah of course you did i think i feel like anyone who uh needs a book recommendation you need to ask pat i mean you need to like really seriously hit him up he's got some great picks (laughs) i have great picks for myself uh i know (laughs) what i like uh you know which is sometimes what other people like so oh yeah The one, the one I said, yeah, I was, uh, I've been reading Animal Horror Cinema, uh, which is oh, this right. ac- academic collection of uh, basically creature features uh, throughout the years. Um, some great fucking uh, hits on that. And yeah, I was, I saw that at uh, Bucket of Blood here in Chicago, which is one of the best bookstores, uh, bookstore record stores in Chicago. And uh, it was, it was definitely a just impromptu fine because i was not that book was not on my radar barely even would have expected that if there's an academic dissertation on animal horror cinema in america and so it's like You're this is definitely it. oh it's so good um a couple movies in there i mean one that i mentioned before i would love to cover is alligator uh the john yeah. sales movie with robert forrester which is right. one i grew up loving talked about just, a lot of cinema speculation as well uh yeah that's right. Uh, it's, it's such a great movie. I mean, that I think was... like those, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I think a lot of those, oh, yeah. we talked about Piranha earlier, just like the, a lot of those, like, you know, a lot of people trying to remake Jaws just in different ways back then, you know? Right. I mean, it's such a, I mean, it started with King Kong being the original animal horror creature feature. It's such like, I mean, it, it it's such a good uh, uh, vehicle for an entertaining movie in terms of like, you have this thing that represents anything, you know, you could have Kong as Christ, Kong as racism, Kong as uh, hmm. whatever. And then, so you can dig into that, but at the same time, you have just like this monster movie that you can sell to audiences. So it just, it just is like made what for- what the monster represents to kind of right. doesn't matter. It could be anything. Yeah. yeah. It could be anything. It could be something very heady. It could be nothing, but uh, it, 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 it's just always been one of my favorite uh, Are you a fan of the like, Godzilla movies then? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, I love it again. Huge. I mean, creature features as my favorite uh, subgenre for sure. Horror yeah. and drama are my favorite uh, high level uh, genres, but like within horror, the that's why mosquito is right up your alley. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. So again, you blew my mind. I was watching a few more scenes after after we talked about it. You blew my mind with that casting because that was a one that I remember watching as a kid, but then having no idea who the uh, the deep talent uh, that was in that movie. So, <laughs> well, totally. Again, just like watching a uh, body double here, you know, like there's a lot of things that you kind of like, I get, you get to see the set of LA, like all these things. Okay. So I also, I'm sorry, here we are tangent at the end of this uh, talk, but I'll just say I'm, I'm literally on season five of um, yeah. You know what I'm going to say? Like we're right about, 
I don't want to say what's going to happen, but we're right about at like the really big turning point in six feet under, like probably going to watch that tonight. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Preparing myself for it. But yet my girlfriend like has no idea what's coming. I've told her to Ooh, stay away from every right. single fucking she never seen that she it. could like ever possibly be aware of. Anyway, the reason I'm bringing up six feet under again is because again, they they're, they're like here, they're in LA. So I'm like getting yeah. experience a show. It's like my third watch through. Um, and I'm getting to like, see these places that like, they just seem like a dream to you, you know, unless you live here and you're like experiencing them every day. Now they're like familiar. Right. And so that's kind of like what body double was like in watching it this time is that I get to see like the farmer's market that I've been to a million times, you know, like, yeah. but, like, it just felt like so mis mis like mysterious LA or mysterious locations at the time. And you like, oh yeah, like not everybody lives in Los Angeles. Like they're like, you know, but if you do, then it's kind of like this like insiders, like, oh yeah, that's like the right. head, you know, or like blah, blah, blah. that's tail of the pup or whatever. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Totally. I mean, most people don't live in LA. So uh, you definitely got the, uh, the, the little insights so you're just making everything better. Well, um, that's what I love about our podcast is like, you've got the, the Chicago connection now and I've got the LA connection. You know, I feel like those are like the two greatest places you could ever live. Like, you know, I guess in my opinion. Um, so like, you know, we've got insight into that. I love when you talk about like going to the music box, like I love going to Los Feliz three, but they're not playing Renfield this weekend. So my girlfriend and I tomorrow are going to go and see Renfield if we can uh, at like any place that is playing it close by. Got to see Renfield. I'm going to rewatch weather, man. Um, that's the one that I was mentioning. Um, Gore Verbinski of, um, Pirates of the Caribbean, awesome oh, right. director, Lone Ranger, Weatherman is his low-key drama that he made, I think, 2006, fucking awesome Nicolas Cage movie, and uh, Nicholas Holt, uh, who's a great kid actor, who's grown up to be uh, an awesome adult actor. Shit, he, so they're in that together. He plays, Nicholas Holt plays Cage's son in that movie. Amazing. And they, it, he's, he's not, you know, he's like, a, he's a major character, he's not like the, Michael Caine is his father, um, also. Um, so it's uh, uh, kind of an ensemble, but um, Nicholas Hall has a lot of uh, pretty important scenes actually in that movie, and um, it's fucking great. I love it. I should rewatch that before I go see Renfield. Yeah, yeah. You excited? I, I know you've oh, been yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> looking forward to it for quite a bit. You've been sending me every single. Um... <laughs> you don't know like what's on my Poster. phone or what I haven't sent you. So like for the audience out there <laughs> listening, like I've been sending. There's so yeah. so because it's a universal picture. I think this is pretty big for Cage. This is like something more like high level than he's been in in a while like he's been in a lot more indie films than like he has big studio shit but this yeah. is this is this is universal's baby this is dracula you know right. so like they're definitely really really pushing it out here and yeah it's on bus like on the side of a bus they got billboards everywhere and I'm not, it's not just in los Feliz, which is where i live it's also in like pasadena which is you know if i'm over in pasadena like everywhere and like, dude, I'm telling you, I've taken pictures and I'm like, I can't send him another one of these. Like, I, there's probably like another. No, five. no, no, no filter. You can you send me all the fucking movie posters, <laughs> especially if it's cage related. So. Yeah, and there's there's definitely like another five billboards that I haven't sent you. Like, uh, it's uh, everywhere you look out here right now. So Keep I really coming. expect good things for like, you know, the box office for it, I hope. Um, I'm a little worried when I see like comedy and Dracula together um that's my only <laughs> hang up i'll sure. just say that right now because I, I i just like want to get into like the character of dracula a little bit more serious than comedic if that makes sense yeah so dracula dead and loving it by mel brooks is right up your alley right <laughs> yeah my leslie nielsen right oh man i rewatched naked gun uh last year Le leslie nielsen was like the fucking a fucking god like yeah. among among comedy like what just generally what he was like uh, I didn't realize how far back he went, like just being a leading man starting in the fifties and then just, just how much, how, how like crazy it was that he was a leading man for like a couple of decades, not like crazy successful. as like a leading man actor, but like, that's what the role he was roles. He was taking like as a dramatic actor. And then just, they just started putting him in comedies. Like he still acted the same. If they just made everything around him, just fucking like spoof and satire. Kind of like Robert Stack was in like a lot of those like old, like, basic um you know yeah i mean they were movies. they were both and in airplane sudden, yeah yeah 
and then or and, and or he's now he's like the host of like unsolved mysteries and that's like all you know him as you know right, it's like right. it's interesting like the way like an actor's career can go based on the choices you make i have a quick leslie nielsen story that i have to tell Ooh, because i'm not please. sure if anybody's gonna hear this one um i don't know if the play yts will ever tell this story but so <laughs> like when the play yts were starting to like really have like success and like you know we're all like so excited about it um all their friends and everybody the family we're watching them on TV. It's like right at the beginning of their success. And WGN is having uh, them on as the musical guests. Um, and so I don't think Delilah had like hit yet, but like they were just like, you know, on their way, like they had been signed to a major label and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Hometown Heroes playing uh, WGN, if anybody in Chicago knows, but anybody else, WGN is kind of like the, the news station that we watched. Like they'd have the Cubs games aired on it and everything. And so that morning, like I remember Tyrio telling me, Dave, Dave Tyrio, who's a guitar player, he's playing my tees, is like, yeah, Leslie Nielsen's going to be on with us. Oh, yeah. So geez. it's like playing my tees, musical guests, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it's a morning show with Leslie Nielsen. And oh, uh, my God. they go to like, uh, this is such a great story. They go to like meet him and Dave like is like, hey, Leslie Nielsen, nice to meet you. And he's like, great to meet you guys, too. And and it's like a fart and like stone face stone cold doesn't move or or twitch and like but this fart just happened you know and so dave shakes his hand or whatever the guy had a fucking whoopee cushion on him and put it underneath his chair and didn't ever acknowledge that that happened just like acted as if he farted <laughs> This was his thing. There are compilation. He did that all over the place. He did that to Conan. He did that to Leno. He did that to uh, <laughs> he. Every talk show he did, or interview for like the last fifteen years of his life, he was bringing the fucking whoopee cushion machine or what, uh, an actual whoopee cushion. And there are compilations on YouTube. You can see him just doing it to everybody. Oh man, what a fucking legend! Which is like so ridiculous he's just and he's he's talked about it like there are a couple interviews was like what's your what's your secret to life he's just like not taking yourself too seriously it's like uh, that yeah. just was his philosophy in life and like because like what fucking actor is going to be doing that for uh decades as they're like um uh as they're making all these uh, comedy movies and he, you you think that maybe he takes himself too seriously nope he's just pulling childish pranks on everybody i mean here <laughs> we are trying to keep entertaining talking himself. about it yeah oh, he was so good man Great that is fun. man okay so that's uh terry was definitely in a uh league of legends who who got uh pranked i know like you got Leslie to experience Nielsen. the whoopee cushion right oh. yeah i'm sure they could tell the story better but that's what i remember from it and um a lot of times like i'll be on like a text thread dave and, and i and uh, matt allison who i've talked about on the podcast before who's our uh, engineer we're on a thread for like a text thread for the cubs and we're always talking about like baseball but every once in a while he'll like we'll bring up the leslie nielsen story because <laughs> it's too good not to like constantly bring up you know oh awesome so why don't we finish up uh body double here so that we um can talk about a few other things especially our uh, music picks of the week and i know you said you had some criterion news you wanted to talk about I'll just say this about Body Double. Not as good as Blowout. If you mm. are watching these back to back, you'll I think you'll enjoy them. And I think that they pair nicely together. I just think that this one is a little bit, you're like moving too much into like De Palma, like you said, uh, having a Alfred Hitchcock wank fest here. I mean, you could go watch. I bet that movie. as a compliment. But I, I know. And, and I sure. think that that's the thing is like, you know, at this point, Hitchcock was gone already four years. He had passed away. So there was like a resurgence. And I wonder in my, I, I mean, I don't know what it's like to live in 84 because I was only four years old back then, but you know, what was the time like? Was, were, did people love Vertigo back then like they do yeah. now? I mean, I know it took a long time for people to like really think of Vertigo as like, in fact, I think Roger Ebert had a lot to do with that because a lot of times it was like, yo, number one best movie of all time is Citizen Kane. And I think like the challenge came from Ebert who was like, no, 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 it's Vertigo, you know? Um, I don't know if it was quite yet looked at, if Vertigo was quite yet looked at as like the movie that it is now. Um, Rear Window, I think was like, pretty big hit like through and through um 
so it's kind of interesting like De Palma was just like a big fan of Hitchcock like from you know all I know about him and he's paying big time homage to him um but it is an original story too I mean it is a cool story De Palma is a good writer um and he knows how to write a good movie um so all in all I think it's a great film this is the one that like I was told watch Body Double and Blowout back in the day from Matt Allison who I've talked about and just just talked about yeah. He said both of these films are right up your alley, Darren. And he wasn't wrong because he knew I loved Albert Hitchcock and both films are very much Hitchcockian um, and, and great films on their own. Um, De Palma, I don't know if he did too much after this film um, that has gotten a lot of accolade. I mean, I, I think he kind of has fallen off, you know, past Body Double. So this might have been like the last great film um of his career. I, I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what came after this. So I don't, I just, I can't recall. I, mean, I guess Untouchables would be 89. So maybe Untouchables was the, the last great De Palma film. Well, I mean, we can go through it kind of quick here. So, I mean, to kind of go back to what we were saying at the beginning, awesome three movie run. Although um, I do Scarface's I mean, people love Scarface, but Scarface is okay. Uh, I mean, Blowout, I love Scarface, but yeah, it's not like on the level that people do. Yeah. Blowout uh, is 81. He followed that up with Scarface in 83. And then just a year later, Body Double in 84. So that was where those fell in. He did uh, a Bruce Springsteen, Dancing in the Dark. Did a movie called Wise Guys, which I'm not quite familiar with. And then Untouchables in 87. Casualties of War, which I still need to see with Michael J. Yeah, Fox Michael J. And Fox. Sean yeah. Penn. I've never seen it. And they just I never have it. either, but yeah, I, I agree. I, I'd always looked good. They played it at um, the Gene Siskel, uh, where we've been a couple of times um, not too long ago. I missed it. Uh, and then Bonfire of the Vanities, which is a notorious, huge bomb, like in Hollywood, just like this. Um, sought after book and everybody hated this fucking movie it was the tom hanks um playing like dan Aykroyd in that too uh bruce willis if Aykroyd's in it it's not a lead or anything uh but it's based on the uh on the novel melanie griffith's in that one as well tom wolf novel it was just a huge bomb so i feel like that's where he probably wasn't able to do everything that he wanted raising cane which again i love carlito's way and then Mission Impossible, which, hmm. you know, which I think I would love to do Mission Impossible actually next. Uh, yeah, keep, so keep I was the wrong. I mean, there's a lot of big, there's a lot of big movies in there past Body Double, but, you know, there, but there's like a lot of misses as well, I feel. Yeah, I mean, but and again, like, I don't, he didn't have, a lot of these movies are coming out. I don't, they're probably not being like, like uh, sold as like Brian De Palma films. Like nobody went to see Mission Impossible because Agreed. Brian De Palma was directing movie, you know, like I'm sure a lot of people were like, "Yeah, that's awesome," but like he was, it was kind of, it was probably like a hired, uh, he was a hired director for that movie, uh, making a um, franchise film. Uh, although he did follow that up with Snake Eyes with Nicolas Cage, and I fucking love that. So, so I don't know. You yeah, know, he, I can. He's just he's he's kind of all over the place. He's not easy. Yeah, to he down is all over in, the place. He's not easy to peg down as as like a, a definable director in Hollywood, and he never has been. So, and then yeah, you, and I mean that's kind of like, like a which cool way to be. So. Like one of those guys is like an artist that doesn't want to make the same, you know, painting the same, paint yeah. the same thing twice. Which is, you know, I like that. Um, definitely has a style though. I mean, you could tell it's a De Palma movie by watching. I mean, Untouchables has that yeah. force majeure stuff the whole time. I mean, Untouchables is one of the greatest films ever, um, in my opinion. I mean, I love it. So There's Chicago this... too. There is this force majeure shot in Mission Impossible that I remember seeing it when I was a kid. Uh, I was not familiar. I saw it like right when it came out. So it was like, like 10 or something. Um, and I was not familiar with De Palma and his shots. But like I, that shot stood out for me like by far when I saw the first Mission Impossible. Yeah. And I mean, this this film that we're talking about today, Body Double, uh, is definitely enjoyable and definitely like something to watch. Um, and I don't mean to say that I don't like it. I do like it. I just don't love it. Um, it's cool. And I've seen it definitely probably like four or five times um, in my life. 
this time being a little bit different of a, a watch because of where I live. And I got to exp experience like your reaction to it too. So I, I'm actually very pleased that you liked it. Um, well, where would you put it on the I scale? Mean, of, I think I liked it more than on. you probably, uh, it sounds like, because I, I, I love yeah. it. Um, again, like just the ability to weave in the horror aspects and yeah. uh, and the and again, like I said, like I, like a plot just doesn't really attract me into a film. It's everything around it, the characters and the aesthetics. That's what I love about it. And so for a movie that's pretty plot heavy that I love, like that's even more accolades. And then uh, I guess that's like the reasons that you like it are actually the reasons why I don't love it as much. Like, I still feel like I got to be invested with the characters and their relationship to like see a kiss like that. Like, I can't I am not, I'm not the kind of guy who can get on board with something where I don't like under, understand like the connection between them. I don't think there's like too much like chemistry between any of the characters, you know? Yeah, it's just like a good story being played out you know well i mean i watch a lot of porn there's not always connection in 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 that so and then they yeah. end up fucking so maybe it's just my porn adult mind is a pro this maybe. porn movie so <laughs> yeah true that and by the way we didn't talk about it we probably should the frankie goes to hollywood scene where he does become a porn actor and then has sex with melanie <laughs> griffith basically to be able to talk to her about like were you the girl that was dancing in the window and to try to get an understanding of what happened to this girl after she gets murdered because uh you know the lead character here does get murdered and like he's left just like in vertigo like obsessed and not not knowing what to do now he he got he made out with her Gloria's now dead the Indian killed her with like a very phallic uh scene by the way with like um oh, I think the drill since, the, the it's, fucking drill yeah, oh my drill God. clearly just you love that dick in this I mean this shot is him drilling this fucking woman literally drilling her but like it's clear just big dick action right there so <laughs> <laughs> totally. And by the way, like, I think uh, Siskel, uh, Gene Siskel had said, like, that's where uh, De Palma lost me. Like when he used <laughs> this big drill to, right. to, to kill the lead character, you know, the lead um, female character. He's like, that's where De Palma lost me. And the rest of the movie sucked after that, basically. Um, it well, does has a twist turn. It kind of becomes a second like life of the movie, yeah. and that's where we meet Melanie Griffith then, and kind of like realize, oh, she's this porn actress. Okay, like now there's this whole scene where uh, they have sex, and then okay, now the Indians after Melanie Griffith and it's gonna kill her. Um, yeah, it kind of does take a different uh, has a second life of its own at that point. Yeah, but then again, that's where Craig Watson when he comes in with his big dick energy as the slick back guy, just acting like the, the porn producer, uh, it's like this other switch and he's fucking great. Is that too? Uh, yeah. He's trying to pose as the, the porn producer. He, he, he fucking nails it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but it ends up like, what did you think of the ending of the film? Uh, pretty funny. Uh, when Melanie Griffith pops up from the, from the grave, I, yeah. I laughed out loud actually <laughs> really okay <laughs> it was and it had to be kind of intentional because like it so it was cutting to um him getting directed by the great dennis franz uh who would be a oh, great right. porn horror director um cut to him like uh you know like going back to, like to the originals like yeah i'm experiencing this this trauma and this uh, this anxiety from the claustrophobia but i'm gonna get through it and then it cuts right back to him actually in the grave. Gets through it. Uh, the antagonist gets thrown off um, into the river, and then he he stands up, and then Melanie Griffith pops up like like um, a gopher or something. And I just laughed out loud. It's like she's like, "What are you doing? What are you one of those necrophiliacs?" It's pretty nonsensical too. Like the fucking dog, and like yeah, like the antagonist Sam like both fall into the river like, like kind yeah. of perfectly you know like it's it, it is it's kind of ridiculous that's a, like that's the thing is like the movie has these like it is like a little cheesy that way and that's I mean, what i and, don't know is it like yeah. 80 cheesy or is it just like cheesy on purpose i don't know, you know? I, I think he is going for that horror kind of vibe and again it's the, that's a, a through line of why i love uh, the movie so much so totally makes sense to me especially knowing you that you would love that those aspects of the film. Um, those are the things that kind of like, I just 
couldn't get on board with a hundred percent. Um, blowout doesn't have so much of that, right? Blowout is like, has some cheesy stuff, but it's perfect. It's just the right amount. This is a little overdone. If you ask me. Um, I agree with everything you say and I will defend cheesy until the day I die. <laughs> yeah, I know you will. Yeah. But anyway, so that's, that's Brian De Palma's blowout. Uh, or I'm sorry, body double. Check it out. I do. I definitely think if you like blowout, you will like this. It's just a different vibe. It, and it's, and it's maybe, maybe it's more fun. You know, maybe, maybe that's, maybe I'm no fun. <laughs> maybe I got to be more like Leslie Nielsen and carry a whoopee cushion around. We can, we can all learn a lot from Leslie. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Good pick, man. You're crushing it with the Palma days. So I, and yeah. again, like I said, maybe we could talk about what to cover next, but I would definitely be down for um, a little bit more De Palma. Um, I think we're kind of, I think I mentioned Mission Impossible. I would definitely be I, down I, I for- I have never seen it. I'm cool seeing Mission Impossible. I yeah. would definitely be, and I mean, that's partly De Palma, but also partly going uh, like more of like watching it as a um, Tom Cruise double feature. Because um, mm-hmm. I know you're on a big Tom Cruise um, kick these days, but yeah. I mean, I, I feel, I, you know what? The more and more I think about Tom Cruise, the more and more I'm fucking loving the guy. Like, yeah. and it's not about what, okay, fine. I'm over, I'm over the- uh, Top Gun Maverick, I, but they've got to make a third one, right? I mean, it feels like the story's done, but it's like such a fucking blockbuster. I feel like they're gonna like do something. Uh, yeah, that's hard to pin down. I mean, he he took this long to make another one because he doesn't fuck around. Like he's, no, he doesn't fuck around. That's he's a such a fucking game. lunatic, and which is what makes him such a great movie star. So it's like uh, there's no, yeah. um, there's no. I don't His know. I yeah, I would know. I wouldn't have no problem with there not being another top gun but um but yeah the original mission impossible and then the most recent mission impossible um fallout um are i think the two best and that would be a fun fucking double feature because fallout is is only a few years old and so it has a lot of top gun uh it just has that over the top real filmmaking obsession that tom cruise has been writhing in the last like 20 years so yeah, and plus with <clears throat> Mission Impossible, we can talk, uh, you know, obviously more about like De Palma. Um, I don't think he really loved that film, um, from what I've heard. I, 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 I no, I definitely re- did. Yeah, I yeah. need to rewatch that De Palma documentary that came out. That was it was excellent, but I, I kind of can't remember. I, I remember enough of him kind of hate hating on that film a little bit. I mean, uh, I'm not surprised at that at all. Again, I, that's a good movie because of Tom Cruise and not necessarily i'm like i watch it as a tom cruise movie not certainly not as a brian de palma movie at all so gotcha uh, even though but then like, here's the thing see about a lot cruise. of the stuff in it so the fucking guy in like comedy stuff like tropic thunder and stuff like that i just like thought about that the other day like this guy's fucking great in that shit yeah. like yeah. i don't know that's a whole nother story but i'm kind of like rolling back like what I think about Tom Cruise and like the media and stuff like that. And I'm starting to look at him just as like more of like the actor, like, like, again, like with my friend Tom back here, like if I can take him out of it and just look at it, the art he's making, like fucking awesome. Like, you know, Tom Cruise, if I could take like who I hearing Tom Cruise is about in the media, if I take all of that away and just look at him as an actor, like top tier, dude. Well, yeah, you got to stop watching TMZ, dude. Yeah, I, I fucking love TMZ. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know I'm preaching to the choir here about uh, Tom Cruise, but yeah, I got to stop watching so much TMZ. I, I, it is one thing I don't quite understand. I don't know how you put that on and actually like. Well, I don't because I don't it. have television. I'm just like literally that's my news source. Like I just like type in TMZ every morning. I'm like, okay, what's happening in the entertainment? You business? type in TMZ every morning. That's your morning yeah. routine with your coffee. Fuck yeah. Like that, I do not go to CNN oh or God. anything like that. Like I I, TMZ, no, yeah, I, mean, I feel like it's truthful, yeah. man. I'm telling you. Uh wait a minute. It's still all celebrity news, right? That's what I know. Pretty about much. TMZ. But okay, what yeah. else is there? What other news is there? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm not gonna defend CNN or MSNBC. I fuck that. Um <laughs> especially not Fox News, but I guess I just find it funny that that's in your routine. <laughs> I mean, I literally, I'm, I'm it, I so. have no other news source. I mean, I don't really go on Twitter or anything like that. It's TMZ. That's it. Uh, I mean, Twitter's a shitty place for news as well. So yeah, gotcha. I mean, you're making, you're making a good case by just eliminating <laughs> all the other ones being like, yeah, that's garbage as well. So yeah. 
Um, all right, maybe, maybe, maybe tomorrow I'll type in TMZ first. <laughs> Probably yeah, not let me know how your day TMZ. goes then, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. love it. Um, all right, cool. Any last closing thoughts? Um, no, I think uh, this is a good talk. Thanks for, uh, you know, opening it up to doing a couple of De Palma features. We'll see what we do next week. Maybe, maybe we'll keep going. Again, like Raising Cain and Phantom of the Paradise or Mission Impossible. I would 100% be down for all of those. So, And then cool. the other one that I was thinking about is Copland, which is a fucking great. Oh, film. yeah, yeah, yeah. With Leota and fucking uh, oh, Stallone. Yeah. And it's uh, James Mangold, who's. Harry uh, Cottel, um, too, right? Harvey, it's it's Ray Liotta, Barbara De Niro, Keitel, a uh, bunch of Mangold did uh, like a lot of great movies. Um, fucking walk, uh, walk the line, walk the line, yeah, yeah. Uh, he did what I actually I think is the best uh, superhero movie, Logan, because uh, it's a straight up western. Um, oh right. He and he's his. Um, I've seen that by the way. I did his, like that. his upcoming movie is actually Bob Dylan biopic. God, no more Bob Dylan shit. Like, just all, dude. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> How many biopics do we need on Bob Dylan? How many, like, fucking biographies on Bob Dylan do we need? Well, they're really, I mean, a straight up traditional one. There hasn't been any. Yeah. Uh, didn't Scorsese do one? That's, a, I mean, that's a documentary. Yeah. A but there's also like, one more, like, which I'm not usually down with biopics, but like a walk the line style movie about Bob Dylan. That's, I mean, that, that's never I really guess that's true, but then there was another, that film that came out a little while ago where it was like Heath Ledger played him, and then yeah, I'm not there, Ledger played and him. that's 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 like a vignette of a bunch of different people uh, playing him in different kind of styles, not really giving anything about his life. That's that was like an art film, which I fucking love, but like again, there's never been really a traditional biopic of like his life, uh, which I'm not saying I need, but. James Gan James Mangold is a great director, and I fucking love Bob Dylan, so I'm definitely well, gonna. He did a great job with Walk. I love Walk the Line, so you know. All right, uh, sign me up. Fine, I'll watch it. I mean, oh. you're pr- yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> what do you got? Yeah, well, you say, yeah. I, if you're watching YouTube, if you're not watching YouTube, Darren's excited for something right now, like really excited. So. <laughs> <laughs> last week we talked about <laughs> let you're right because last week we talked about air i have a story about air yeah okay well i fucking saw air <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> at the los feliz three so i saw half of air whoa so you go first okay i loved it uh Air. Look at you. Listen, Look at listen. you. I didn't want to see it. If you go back and rewind the last week's <laughs> conversation, I was like, fucking Ben Affleck and blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. You know, fucking who gives a shit? Okay. I liked Argo and I like him as a director. I just kind of like can't get over like Ben Affleck. It's kind of like just, just like, I don't know. It's like just something about him. I just feel like he's just kind of like a, a kind of a bum. But uh, I do like yeah. him. That that's not to say I don't like him. I just you know again, it's like he's like kind of like whenever I see him, I'm just like God, oh, Jesus, this guy. He just reminds me of like the guy who drinks like Red Bulls all fucking day and like you know, I don't know. So he smokes cigarettes. He's just like a weird guy. I don't know. Um, but anyway, you pay too much attention to these fucking actors' lives by watching TMZ. Uh, you're right. You're right. I go into these movies with zero baggage because I fucking I can't stand watching uh, their personal lives. They're, okay. Okay. Just, okay. You're bringing in too much baggage. I'm just gonna say that. So okay, I, you're right. You maybe you're right, but <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed it, especially because of the fact that look, like we're from Chicago, like we fucking love Michael Jordan. Yeah. And I liked a lot totally. of it. Um, another kind of interesting thing about it, and this is not giving too much away, but like not not really showing Michael Jordan in it. Um, I thought it was like a kind of like a Top Gun Maverick move of, um, yeah. you know, not showing who the enemy is or whatever. Like everybody always knows like who my, I think that was like his uh, point. It's like everybody knows who Michael Jordan looks like. So if you show him like it's and it wasn't the story movie. it had. Right. I mean, it wasn't the story. Yeah, right. exactly. So that was perfect about it. So um, that's awesome that you loved it. Yeah, I still yeah. have to finish uh, the second half of it. I, I went to go it. see it with my friend Cody, who's a big um, fan of Michael Jordan, uh, as you oh, know, yeah. the lead singer of the Cutthroats. And um, he's like, yo, we got to go see Air, Air today. Uh, I was like, yeah, let's go see it. So I was pleasantly surprised. I loved it. I thought you'd enjoy that. Uh, what was your experience like? Uh, shitty. I went to Alamo Draft House, which has been good. But as we, as we discussed, I can't fucking stand people eating chicken wings. It was That's your second time that's happened to you. 
Uh, it was brutal. It was the only time I've left the Alamo. Uh, there were a lot of people in other screenings that I didn't leave, but like it was it was it was pretty shitty like and i'm not like in you know i'm not in, i'm a very patient person it was just like i didn't need to I, yeah I'm, it's kind sure. of gotta be a lot to to bring you over the edge like that i i feel like yeah, yeah and it was, again it wasn't like out. me like protesting anything i was just like this is a movie that i'm gonna be able to watch again these these people are being really fucking loud with their food and so i'm just gonna finish the second half at another time because i was why do you go to this fucking theater i mean this well is like it just opened happening. this is only the this is only like the fourth or fifth time and it's it is a great theater it's just i'm not full fully on board with the whole dining experience at a theater i don't know maybe maybe you are, are you ordering like full meals when you're going to any movies or anything not a fucking chance and yeah exactly so yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna shit on people who would like to do that but it just it Dude, doesn't get... really appeal to me and but and so i mean because i so support like what alamo does in terms of like screening and programming the movies they play um they got like they're playing days confused tomorrow just randomly because they just want to show it um i just have to be a little more more conscious and not go into like sold out screenings or anything so Fair enough. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, I haven't been to an Alamo draft house. I don't mean to shit on it because I, I don't know the experience, but I, I don't like the, you know, full meals bullshit. Like when I go to um, films, like I, I rarely even get popcorn, but when I do, like I kind of eat it all and like before the movie even starts, you know, so I always get to a theater like, yeah, it's like pretty serious for me to get like to a theater way before it starts. I like to get like a good seat and just kind of be there. Dude, there's nothing like a, a cherry coke. I was just talking to my girlfriend about this last night. Getting a cherry coke like at fucking New Beverly. Oh yeah, Ugh, there you dude. go. And it says tasty beverage on the cup. Like <laughs> fucking experience is so great. I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, Arab, I uh, I recommend if you haven't seen the yeah. end of it, uh, go back and see it whenever you do. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying that I saw it, but I did. You just gotta listen to me and my recommendations a little. I bit know, I know. <laughs> without bringing the TMZ baggage into it, so, that's, true, uh, that's true. I mean, I, I fucking love the Affleck brothers. Casey is a fucking amazing movie, yeah, uh, or actor, and I definitely want to cover Manchester. Um, oh, up, fucking love Manchester! I mean, it's up there with that's uh, that was one of my favorite movies of that decade. Um, <laughs> and The Way Back, I think, is an underrated Affleck movie. Um, I think I mentioned it last week. So it yeah, I think that was coming off of like. Uh, his last alcoholic binge uh here i go bringing the baggage into it again but that was like i think on the heels of that so i was be interesting i think you said it was kind of that's kind of meta in that way right it's like kind of deals with alcoholism i mean he's just he's playing a ragged ass dude and you're like this is not that far from what this guy's actually going through (laughs) yeah yeah and and it's it's a good movie so um yeah support the athletes for sure um yeah, and again, again, I don't want to come off as like uh, with this Alamo stuff, like uh, not being like impatient or anything. It's just like that experience. I was just like, I don't need to finish this movie. I can watch it later. So I'm gonna. Yeah, I, I know. I get so. it. Yeah, <laughs> dude. If that's all you can focus on, like, and if you can't be, if, dude, if you can't, if you can't, it is be it, stoic in that situation. You got to go. It is interesting because they they push the no phones <laughs> so hard, uh, <laughs> which is great, but. What I'm coming to realize, it's like, oh, yeah, they push that so hard because you're fucking listening to everybody else eating shit the, and ordering stuff the entire time. It's like, so that's like, and, it, and as a business model, it makes sense. Like, they are, I guarantee they're banking so much money from all the food and beverage. Like, that's why yeah. their membership uh, and ticket prices are not that expensive. It's because, like, they're making all their money on food and beverage by far. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. No doubt about that. So, you know. Music box is always going to be my home, but you know, it's a, it's a nice little uh, backup so far for a theater that again, both of these are I'm like walking distance from my place. So. Oh yeah. That's great. Happy to have it. Um, music box. Maybe we'll stick on that for a second before we get to music. They're doing the Robert Zemeckis uh, series this Saw weekend that. and Frighteners is tomorrow night, Saturday night, midnight. You'll be there. It's going to be a, banger of a screening i might i'm pretty sure i'm gonna have to go the midnight movies have not like just i don't know maybe i'm getting old 
but uh, I'm not getting to all the midnight movies that I uh, usually went to in my younger age. But you know, having no kids is great, so I can just go to a midnight movie whenever. I, I mean, want. but you're not going to see the. I mean, the Frighteners is a pretty big one to be seen at Music Box at you know midnight. It's it's definitely a, a fun. Yeah, I'm just talking like I don't know if I'm going to stay awake the whole time. That's all I'm saying. Dude, I'm come for Jake Busey, stay <laughs> Michael J. Fox. <laughs> right, 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 right. Oh man, what is that? talk about a life lesson and that. Um, but yeah, like. If we get out of here actually soon, I might go see Used Cars. That's tonight. Yeah, um, got to. They played Flight last night, which is a super underrated movie. Never with, seen. Um, I love Flight. with Denzel with, Washington. With right? Denzel, yep, and plays uh, an alcoholic Chuck. in that too, right? Yeah, yeah. I like the uh, I like the alcoholic and uh, the addiction stories. So I, I mean, I I don't say that kind of a, reason. Then, like, I just kind of remember that about these movies, even though I, yeah. I haven't seen them. That's the thing about Zemeckis. I mean, he's like. He's almost like a De Palma on a bigger budget level. It's like he's he's hard to define and he kind of has a style, but he could still work it within like kind of mainstream projects. And I mean, Zemeckis's name isn't up there with Spielberg, but in terms of like his cultural relevance and the movies that he's been making since the late 70s, I mean, he's definitely up there. Yeah. Um, and they're playing all three Back to the Futures on Sunday. Forrest Gump, which is a fucking crazy movie. <laughs> like the older it gets, the more insane of like a, what a boomer wank fest that movie was, even though like I saw it when I was like seven. So it's like, it's just, a, that was for me such an interesting movie. Like I saw the movie when I was seven. So I had no understanding of like, this is Man, what like boomer wank fest. I've never heard it put that way, but you're right. I mean, it's 100%. I mean, that is 100%. That, that, that movie was like, made to jerk off boomers in 94 <laughs> and just everything they went through through like the right. 60s and 70s and, right but like when i saw it when i was a kid like i had no like I, I, it was largely like how i like was introduced to like a lot of cultural uh milestones and just learning sure. kind of like learning about like that historically how, yeah obviously it was like you know it was a fictional character but like that it was based on things that actually happened right uh, elvis and you know just everything in there talk so. about technology of putting him in those scenes and everything like that which was really yeah. cool kurt russell playing elvis in that movie so you know if anything there's that one so <laughs> and and also the fact that like i mean that that swept the academy awards pretty much that's the other thing that's just crazy about hollywood it's like it's like this movie that movie was like people were obsessed with that movie and like now it's just viewed as just like uh, an anomaly in Hollywood. It's like it's just uh, it's a loaded film. I guess is a good way to put it. Interesting. Oh yeah. So Zemeckis at Music Box. Um, well, that's all I got. I'm regular random shit. Well, talk about. I love it. Um, here we are. Great, another great episode. We'll finish it off with our music. All I can say is that by the next time we talk, we both better have seen Renfield so we can fucking gush on that shit um gush no uh no vampire uh pun you know well, i'm not gonna jinx it but you loved air so it's possible you're gonna hate renfield oh don't don't go there <laughs> i mean yeah it, it may if it's comedy in the way that i think they might do it where it's a little bit more campy i might not love that but we'll see we'll see yeah. I, I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch um no. All right, so music pick. I'm going to go with this because the Lemonheads uh, I've been loving my whole life. And I, there's two records in particular that they've done that I just really, really, I mean, they're, they're front to back. Perfect. Um, it's Shame About Ray, which was like a 20 year anniversary last year. Uh, and they toured on that. And it was missed by me. And I'm sad about that. It's a shame that I missed that uh, Shame About Ray tour. But this year, it's the 20th anniversary of their big album, <clears throat> which is like, you know, got that song, Into Your Arms, which is like the, probably their biggest hit, Come On, Feel, the Lemonheads from 93. So uh, they're going to be putting out like a, and they've been kind of teasing singles of like unreleased songs from it and, you know, like radio performances where they play it acoustic. And uh, this song in particular, I want to talk about because I just really love it's the fourth song called Down About It on this record. And um, it's like one of this and the song called Totally by Screeching Weasel are like kind of both 
integral in me understanding the low harmony. And I, I think I talked about the low harmony last time when we talked about Screeching Weasel, because um, my pick last week was Screeching Weasel. And there was a song called Totally on a record called Anthem by, uh, of a New Tomorrow um, that had these low harmonies where I'm like, wow, what is that? Like, how do you sing like that? This song in particular in the second verse has this great low harmony that he sings all the way through it and i just love it so much um but it's a great song too it's called down about it that's my pick uh if you're out there listening you got to check out this song you got to check out this record the record in general fully front to back is fucking perfect and i can't wait for the 20th anniversary edition to come out um i that's my pick of the week man what do you what do you got oh yeah love to get a little Lemonhead appreciation. Um, are you I'm a fan? Sure, are you a fan of them at all? I, I mean, I certainly like them. Uh, I don't remember last time I like put on one of their records actively, but uh, gotcha. And I'm I, into your arms. It's. I guarantee I've heard it, and I, I'm just trying to think of the melody. Right I mean, now. I know a place where I can go when I'm alone. Into your arms and woe into your arms. You don't. You. I'm sure you know that. Yeah. That was just my way of getting you to sing. So <laughs> yeah. I knew it's I knew the, the song sounded like so. That's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> I so to all everybody audience, just turned off the podcast. Right? No, they're all thanking me. He's like, thanks, Patrick. For, for that's <laughs> that's what they came here for. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. That's awesome pick. So um I'm looking forward to hearing it again because that so the song that you picked that just added it to the list that one i probably have not heard uh anytime recently so yeah 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 cool i mean if you get a chance and you got some time that that record i think you'd enjoy uh maybe it's maybe it's good for like your run or something like that there's uh there's a few like faster tunes in it but mo most of it's pretty like it's just some late it's laid back too you know oh yeah a little bit of um all right awesome so this is actually good because we've been you keep on getting synergy with our music picks is just lining up um you know because uh, for similar vibes so the song and the band that i'm featuring so the band the clean from new zealand never heard never heard okay so yeah like a lot of kind of a loaded band for me so they're from new zealand they started in the 70s um had a major compilation in 86 because they were just kind of like an indie band that, you know, never like official releases, but they did have a compilation that came out in 86 that was kind of popular. Broke up and um, multiple times kind of throughout the late 80s and 90s. And I saw they had um, some reunions in like 2014 with some shows. Oh, nice. Um, but very pivotal and influential um, indie band. You know, they so their sound, as they kind of claimed, was highly um inspired by velvet underground and uh the ramones so coming out of new zealand in the early in the late 70s and early 80s they just kind of had a um a vibe that was influenced by that but then looking forward and with this especially with the song that i'm picking today which was just called anything could happen this song sounds straight out of the early 90s in terms of vibe um the um this specific song sounds a lot like pavement uh which is a band i love heavy uh essential band from the 90s um i mean very, that's very art arty you know yeah and so i think they're just a i mean so the reason why i'm picking it is so the original founding member actually just passed away i, I came across hamish kilgore uh oh, no. one, of the, one of the original founding members uh died at 65 uh from new zealand and so I just wanted to kind of throw a little spotlight on them. So I came across The Clean um, by picking up one of their records based on somebody's recommendation who was working at the record store. I think it was Grimey's actually in Nashville. Um, it was on one of my Southern road trips, which I love taking road trips to the South. Um, it may have been in Atlanta. I, it was either in Atlanta or Nashville where I picked up one of the records. It was the compilation. It was entirely based on like talking to a couple of the people working there. I was just hanging out for a while and somebody was just really, you know, based on all the music they were talking about, he was really suggesting I pick up this album. A great story. Yeah. And so this is, again, I, I doubt, 
I would have ever really come across them yeah. and certainly never like deep uh dove deep into like their compilation if it wasn't for like me picking it up from that physical yeah like um, New Zealand like music isn't really like cross my radar or anybody's I think you know without a recommendation to be honest kind of yeah I mean so they got a little bit of I mean so this song actually has like seven million hits on Spotify so it's not like a super deep cut I mean this song is kind of a hit you know like on Spotify which is more of like like we're saying more of like a contemporary um gauge of like how popular the song is so um yeah so like again this is just another example of a band that like I mostly wouldn't have been familiar with is it, if it wasn't for like you know hanging out at you know record stores and actually being able to talk to people uh love that. just what why we're here talking about movies um so it's just one of those uh bands and that specific album has stuck with me for many years and um and yeah and this again this the connection between velvet underground to the 80s when this was produced this song would have come out sometime in the early 80s like i said it was on the compilation in 86 um i don't i didn't find a clear date of when it actually came out but then sounding so much and feeling so much like a 90s song um, and the lyrics are very 90s, very existential, looking for meaning, but then realizing there's no meaning in life and <laughs> living in the um, present. I mean, that's the, entire, the point of the entire song. Anything could happen, and it could be right now, um, is the chorus. And it's just, it, it, it so lines up with existentialism and Buddhism. You know, life is meaningless. Life has no inherent purpose, so it's up to you to create it. I love the lyrics and again like it just captures the vibe of the 90s and the sound way ahead of its time so I love that yeah so anything could happen by the clean on the compilation 86 um very catchy song it's just like extremely catchy so it's always been on uh, playlist after playlist for me so kick ass and let it be on our remainders podcast jukebox hell yeah so like i said the synergy with these 90s vibes uh keep yeah, going I'm well ahead, with the limited, the, so yeah the clean <clears throat> all right great well um i really feel like we spent a lot of time talking about a lot in this episode um if you're listening all the way through thanks for sticking with us and yeah let us know that was cool to talk about don's comment about lithgo like uh, that's like what i would love to have a little bit more feedback um from anybody listening so that we can talk about it you know next time we get together um don thanks for that comment um man we got to have you on the podcast one time you know i think maybe by season three maybe we can invite some guests on and it might be fun to you know have somebody else kind of come in for uh you know a spotlight but um in the meantime if you're there and listening and you have some comments on body double please uh leave them wherever you may be youtube you know we're all over the social medias and we do check it all the time just to see if anybody comments and when you do it does light up our life so excited about what might come of people's thoughts on body double thanks for discussing it with me pat and next not next week but the week after that we will dive into our next film and talk to you guys then awesome to talk to you looking forward to those renfield texts thanks everyone for listening yep you got it and hey enjoy zemeckis uh weekend if you get out this weekend oh man it's gonna be wild michael j fox Always, always welcome. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Okay, we'll talk to everybody soon. Pat, signing off. See you next uh, in two weeks. See you, bud.